All right, hello, Rich Folly here on the set of PBS Book View Now at Book Expo America. It's Friday, conference still cranking behind us, people everywhere, lots of booksellers. And on our couch right now, we're honored to have Sylvia Day, the author of the wildly best-selling Crossfire series. Hello. So nice to have you. Thanks for having yeah. me, I appreciate it. I had to ask the number of books you've sold because the number is like that thing on the McDonald's sign that keeps going 24 yeah. <laughs> billion sold. It's now, I think, yeah. up to 18 million copies of the Crossfire series yeah. making their way into readers' hands out there. That's gotta feel just incredibly overwhelming. It's very staggering, yes, absolutely. To imagine that many people sitting somewhere in the world reading my book, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so when you, I, I want to go back to the beginning because here you are now, 18 million books uh, in the reader's hands, your new one, one with you, everyone's so excited about, which is closing this series, a new one coming, we'll talk about that too. Yeah. But go back to before this all happened, that moment when you were like looking out ahead and hadn't, don't have all those books out and how much your life has changed right now, but tell us about that moment when you were like just starting this process. Well. I sat down to write my first book in October of 2003, and I finished it in November, and then I thought, okay, this is good. I know my pace. It's like four weeks, right? I, I cannot maintain that anymore, but at the time, I thought, okay, this is, this is how it'll be. Started writing the next book, started writing the next book in June of the following year, so we're talking just a few months later. I heard there was a contest that was being run by New York Times bestselling author Lori Foster. She was going to read the entries, pick 20, and send them to her editor, and you know, you would see what would happen. And she chose me as a finalist, and the editor acquired my book. So within a year after I sat down to write my first book, I sold my first book, and it just kept rolling from there. It just. It just was nonstop. That first editor ended up buying 12 books for me, the first six books she bought for me within the first year that we were working together. So I felt like no matter what happens, I have enough work that's being published and going out there and readers can kind of get a, a sense of my style. And if they like me, maybe I can keep doing this indefinitely. Yeah, they like you a lot. Yeah. You, you're, the books that you're writing are, uh, they're steamy love stories. There's an erotic element to all of them, obviously. At the time you were writing them, did you know just how big that marketplace would be? No, and actually when I started, one of the reasons why I was so interested in that contest that Lori was offering was because the editor had an imprint that specialized in what she called sensual fiction. And it was really one of the only ones that was out there. And so I thought, that's, that's the market that I need to be in because that's the type of book that I write. I've, I've been writing the same book for 13 years, the same style. And it's a little hot, it's a little steamy, and that, that needs to, to find the right audience. And to do that, you need to have a publisher who knows exactly where to place it and how to package it and put it out there. And, and she was the only one. Now, of course, it's a bit different. Yeah. Well, that, there's always been a marketplace for steamy romance. Always. Always. Always, but yeah. But it seems to have exploded, obviously, in recent years, and you're one of the reasons for that. Talk to me about sort of that growing awareness and, ex and, and embrace of this for women readers primarily. Well, there's a lot of talk that, you know, there was kind of a boom that happened right around the time that the first Crossfire book came out, Bared to You, which was in 2012. But I've been around long enough to have seen a similar boom that happened in 2006, and that was when all of the major publishers started creating imprints that were dedicated to sensual fiction. And previously, like I said, there was just Brava, that was it. And then all of a sudden, you know, Penguin started to have the Heat imprint, HarperCollins had Red, um, and it just started building from there. So now everybody's offering, you know, dedicated lines to right. erotic fiction. It exploded, this was in 2006. And then it was kind of like a glut. <laughs> and people were into it, and then they weren't. So we saw it wane in 2007. It really had a very short-lived amount of time. But those of us who had been successful in that, that surge continued to write to our readership and continued to do very well doing what we were doing. And then when the surge came again in 2012, you we know, it was ready. like, we were ready, yeah. exactly. And I had a huge backlist of work. So people who found me with Baird to You saw that there was 20 other novels that I had written, and they went back and read all of those, and it just kept going from there. Yeah, it's nice when you have a backlist that has nice. an undiscovered backlist at that. When it's important for that backlist to be indicative of your writing. Right. 
you know, if you decide to switch genres somewhere along the way, that kind of throws readers off because yeah. they pick up an older book and go, wow, this doesn't sound anything like this author that I've fallen in love with. But if you, if you know what you're good at and you continue to do that and your backlist is indicative of, of the style that you, you follow, then readers can enjoy everything you've written. Yeah. You said you've been writing the same book since for 13 years. So, yeah, yeah. I'm sure that that, <laughs> yeah. that was like a treasure trove to those readers, I'm sure. Well, let's talk a little bit about Gideon Cross and Eva Trammell, these characters that you've introduced in Crossfire. And now you're finished with, I mean, you, what Buried to You came out how many years ago? 2000 that was in 2012. 2012. Yeah. Now one with you closes off this series, these characters that so many people have gotten to know, that you've gotten to know, that they've lived with you for a long time. What's it like to sort of wrap up a series of two people that have been in your head for that long? For that long. You know, I expected right around the time that I got to the third book and I realized I could see the end at that point. I knew it was coming. Did you always know how many books? I, I No, I thought it was going to be two novels. I started out thinking that Ava was going to have a story, Gideon was going to have a story, and I'd be done. And then we rolled into three books. And at the three, you know, the three book mark, I realized it's going to be five. Yeah, like, more to I tell. could see the end. It's going to be five books. So people would ask, you know, are you sure there won't be six? Are you sure there won't be seven? I'm like, no, I, I can see the end. It's five books. And I figured when I got to that point, I was going to grieve. It was going to be so upsetting to me to have to say goodbye to these characters that I've spent so much time with. And yet when I got to the end of the book, I was elated. I was so thrilled. I, I had to take a bit to process it and figure out why am I so excited yeah, to am be I, over? Am I ready for them you know? to be gone or what? Yeah, why? And then I realized it's kind of like preparing kids to go off to college, you know? You give them all the tools that you can, you, you try to teach them right and wrong, you, you give them as much of a toolbox that they can use moving forward, and then there's that point where you have to say, well, now you have to do it yourself. Like, I, I can't do it for you anymore. Yeah. So you're a little bit concerned. Maybe they're gonna need me, maybe they're gonna need, you know, some guidance along the way, yeah. but for the most part, you know, you did a good job, so let them go. Let them go. Where and do, do they thing. live now? Where do they, like, do you just tuck them away in the back somewhere no, in your head? Or no, where do no. they stay? I write in the same fictional universe. So I write historical romance, I write futuristic romance, I write paranormal romance, contemporary, but they're all set in the same world. Right, so they can so, cross over. You'll yes, find them again. We see, like, grandchildren, great great grandchildren of some of my historical characters in my contemporary novels. Nice. And so it, it's never really goodbye. We always, you know, they're always existing in that same place along with everybody else. Yeah. But, you know, it, they're just not the star of the show anymore. That's right. Well, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll be anxious to see where they pop up again in some way, shape, or form. Um, besides the heat, which is the, obviously one of the um, primary elements of your books, there's the stories of this sort of family dysfunction or, in this case, um, sexual abuse for both of your characters. And that's an obviously important element to their character development, coming to grips with that, learning to deal with it, learning to have a relationship that can matter, a fulfilling relationship. Where did that come from? And talk to me about how important that is to these characters in the books in general. Well, there's a stereotype about romance and love stories that they're stories about perfect people, great, handsome, wealthy guy meets beautiful, ambitious young woman, and they fall in love and get married. A billionaire, usually. Yes. That's boring. Yeah. Nobody would be interested in that story. Right. What they want to see is people who are inherently flawed and flaws that are relatable, where you can look at them and say, I've made that mistake before, or I have that fatal flaw to my you know, personality. I don't, have, I don't have it together. This person doesn't have it together. So I, I can watch them navigate this journey to being a better person and root for them, wish them well, and, you know, and hope that they move forward. That's what we're in invested in when we're reading love stories, watching people who realize that they could be a better person and they want to be a better person because they've met somebody that they've fallen in love with and they want to be worthy of this person. That is probably the most heroic thing you could possibly imagine somebody doing, you know? Changing themselves for the better because they've fallen in love with somebody. Right. So that's what, that's what a love story is. In the case of Gideon and Ava, you know, we've got two people who come into the relationship with this history of childhood sexual abuse, which some readers were like, it's such a dark subject. Why would you choose to, to write about that in a story that we kind of, you know, has elements of fantasy to it? You know, yes, he's, he's a billionaire. That's a, that's a fantasy. But what makes us fall in love with him is that he's so flawed. So... Did you know that always, that the, like that flawed element was so important to your writing? Like, did that come naturally to you? Or did you have to think about that when you were putting together like your writing style? Or was that, was that the kind of characters you were always attracted to? I like to see people make mistakes. 
I especially like to torture my characters. And in order for me to do that, I have to give them a situation that they fail. They have to fail. Yeah. So that the next time they experience that situation, they've learned and grown, and now they can succeed. So for me, I mean, yeah, absolutely, it's important for me that these characters have, have these sorts of, of traits that are maybe not heroic mm -hmm. and not desirable. And it opens the door to redemptive you exactly, know, elements. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And, you know, and touching on, on subject matters that are dark, you know, I've touched on infertility, of course, childhood sexual abuse, childhood abuse. Why? It's because I believe that there's a love story for every reader. Anyone, any reader should be able to pick up a novel that gives them an inspiring story that they can relate to that touches on their own personal history and can see that this can happen for me. I can find this. I can have this. And it's true to my story, and yet it's laying the groundwork for me to maybe take some steps in my own life that, that are going to get me where I want to go. Yeah. Well, you, you've played with these characters for some time now. We've gotten to know them. They may come back. Perhaps they'll come back in your next series, which we've been hearing about for like the last year and a half. Yeah. I mean, it's been a while. They announced Blacklist like almost two years ago. Yes. And it's still out there. It's coming in 2017 sometime. But that's the kind of writer you are right now. When you announce a new series two years ago, we wait until 2017 for it to come out. I feel like it's a Harry Potter movie or something. You know, like there's, like, <laughs> there's that much buzz about it. Tell me about Blacklist, whatever you can. And, um, and where you're going with that series. Absolutely. Well, the Crossfire series, over the course of five novels, covers a very short window of time, right? We meet them in June, and the series ends in September of that same year. So just a few months that yeah. we get to follow these characters. In the case of Blacklist, I get to follow them over a span of years. So we, the, the timeline is not linear, so we get to see them at different stages. It's almost like writing about two different couples because they're so different when they first meet. They're in college, you know. At that point in time, you're absolutely certain that all of your dreams are going to come true, right? There, there's no way you're not going Sadly, to succeed yes. and get everything that you're planning on. It takes a while, yeah. four or five years, sometimes a little bit longer to realize that, you know, sometimes dreams don't come true. Sometimes where we thought our life was going to end up is not where it ends up, and yet, Everything happens the way it's supposed to, at the time that it's supposed to, and the way that it's supposed to. So these characters, we see them very young and idealistic, and then we see them again later on a little bit jaded. Mm -hmm. And the question for me in dealing with Kane and Lily is, everybody comes into a relationship with baggage. In their case, they're coming into a relationship with baggage that they gave to each other. So at that point, you have to say, can I forgive somebody for, for the reason why it didn't work the first time? And maybe there's there's a point to it not having worked out the first time. Maybe we need to let it go. Maybe we need to move on and find something else. Or can two people fall in love in two completely different ways as two entirely different people in two entirely different relationships? And I find that so fascinating. But you know, that's why I write stories that are love stories, because for me, I'm focusing entirely on these characters and their arc. There's not this great mystery to be solved, a murder, you know, to a riddle to, to figure out. There's, there's just two people evolving. And that's so fascinating to me. Yeah. It and sounds so Ken and Lily, we get to see a lot of evolution. You know what's fun about this is that clearly we don't know anything about these characters other than what you've shared in various places with Ken and Lily. And yet you can tell that they've been living in your head for quite some time. Yeah. And that you're talking <laughs> about the Crossfire series, but you're living Ken and Lily right now, it would sound like. Yes. Yeah. And, and that's, it's a little bit different now at this stage of my career. Um, there was a time earlier in my career where I would write a novel, turn it in, and it would be a year before it yeah. was actually published. In the meantime, I wrote three or four different books. So by the time the novel came out, I, I'm so yeah. far gone. You're, you're, you're like, you, oh, what was that book I wrote? You're like, oh, yeah, that was like four <laughs> books ago. Yeah. Um, now I'm at the point where, you know, I write a novel and it's in readers' hands as soon as possible. Right. So it's still fresh for me at the time that they're getting it. But there's always, in that fictional universe that, that lives in my head, yeah. stories are happening all the time. Right. And I can see them shooting off in different directions at the time I'm writing one story. And so sometimes I have to write a scene really quick and, and put it aside. There's folders of little mini scenes of, of this and the other thing. And basically, as I get toward the end of a series, I look at who's shouting the loudest. 
Let's say, all right, so I guess it's you. It's because your turn. You, you're the most strident character. Yeah. <laughs> Clearly, you're ready. So I love let's that work that they you. speak to you, that they, like, they sort yeah. of announce that they're ready for their treatment. Yes. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And my son finds that very funny because I, I will end up talking back to them. So he In said, public? Uh, when I'm, when I'm working at my desk, oh, okay. no, when I'm working at my desk, but he'll have his friends over and they'll be hanging out and I'll be shouting at the monitor about something that's happened. And uh, I remember once I heard his friend say, who is your mom talking to? And he's like, oh, she's just talking to her book again. So you visualize by speaking out loud to your characters. I mean, you actually carry sometimes on sometimes. Sometimes they're frustrating. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you gotta shake a little, little bit. Yeah. yeah. And that's something I tell readers all the time because they're like, why did this happen? Or, you know, why did you, why did this character get hurt this way? Why did this happen? And to a certain extent, I'm more of a narrator than a creator. I want the story to go in a particular direction. Oftentimes, it doesn't go in that direction. And that's the point where I get frustrated enough to say, why? Why yeah. did you do that? And they usually know why. They know yeah. why. It's their story. They yeah. can tell it better than I can. There you go. Well, a lot of excitement for One With You. And for the end of the series, that's a sad thing. But knowing that Blacklist is so far along and that it's not that far away probably makes people feel a lot better about that. Uh, Sylvia Day, 18 million copies of the Crossfire series in print. More to come, I'm sure. Um, but so nice to have you join us. Thanks. Thanks so Thank you for, for having here. me. Yeah.